What? <laughs> you could have done that. <laughs> yes. Is it at the perfect level? I think so. Yeah. Okay. You sure? Do you want me to keep messing with it? No, no. Because like you're tempting me to keep messing with it. Super fucking loud over here. Oh my god, now it's quiet. I can't hear anything. Son of a bitch. This is so back and forth. <laughs> Why is this episode 10? We should not be having this many problems. I blame the alcohol. Yeah. It yeah. used to be a song. It was like I blame the... Blame it on the... It's the Justin Timberlake song. Uh, 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 uh. No, there was like a Jamie uh, Foxx song oh. or something. Blame it on the vodka. Blame it on the... Dizzy. Oh, no, no. no, no blame no. it on the boot shift. Mine was like blame it on the... Uh, 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 alcohol. alcohol. Yeah. That's Justin Timberlake? No, you're right. It's uh, not Justin it's like Timberlake. It's like Jamie Foxx or something, right? Hit me with it, babe. What are we at? Yeah, it's Jamie Foxx. Called it. I think that was off the Ray soundtrack. The what? <laughs> the <just> Ray? <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Another week. <laughs> Episode 10. We have hit the double digits. Yeah, we have. Whoa. 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 Wait a minute. Whoa. Well, it's Roman numerals, so technically we were in double digits as <laughs> no, soon as we got to <laughs> number two, but... <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> we we have hit the X. We have hit the X. That's a, <laughs> not, no. not like that. Not like that. Not like that. <laughs> anyway, welcome to I'll Drink to Fact, the true story versus Hollywood podcast, where we talk about your favorite Hollywood movies, or, you know, not Hollywood movies. Not all movies are made in Hollywood nowadays. I guess that's true. You know? Um and we talk about their, their true story movies, and we compare them to the, the true stories and true tell you story, which movies are full of fact and which are full of crap. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's where we're at. Yeah. This week we have a doozy for you. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the, uh, it's, it's, we're talking about two different movies uh, yes. An American Crime, which is the, seems to be the more factual of the two. And then uh, the girl next door, um, not, not the one with the Mill Hirsch and what's her face? I don't know. The other, that blonde chick. The blonde chick, um, where she was like a porn star or something. Um, this is the uh, much different. deeper, darker version, uh, but came out in 2007. Um, and they both chronicle the story of Sylvia Likens. Yes. So it, we'll spend the majority of the time on the American crime and with some other facts from the girl next door. Yeah, if you're unfamiliar with the story, I just want to say it up front. Um, this story is extremely graphic and gruesome and just plain disturbing. So I won't be offended if you skip this episode. But it's, it's a heavy story, but we also wanted to uh, make people aware of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean... We'll talk about the movies and not be too graphic. Um, when the true story comes along, it'll be probably a lot more graphic. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. I mean, it, true life is sometimes graphic, you know? Unfortunately and, um, so. Humanity can be a horrible thing, which the story will tell. But, I mean, you know, we're aware of these things. And the goal is to not let ourselves become these type of people, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To be much, much, much better people. Yes. Yes. So, um, with that started, we will kick this off. Wait, before we get into the story, Daniel, what's in your cup? In my cup is a cocktail for this episode. Mm -hmm. I called it The Neighborhood because The Neighborhood kind of plays a part in this story. As in, there goes the neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood. It has a few different things in it. I'm a big fan of Knob Creek whiskey for Christmas. My future in-laws got me a bottle of smoked maple Knob Creek, which is delicious. So it's got a little bit of that in it. Um, I put some cinnamon whiskey, which we got on a crazy sell today. We were <laughs> at the grocery store and they had a half gallon of Fireball for $9.90. $10. Yeah, 10 bucks. 
we, we, we've never drank Fireball, you know, but how do you pass that up? So we're going to sneak it into things. Look forward to lots of cocktails. Lots of cinnamon cocktails <laughs> coming up. Uh, so anyway, we got smoked maple in Knob Creek, some cinnamon whiskey. I got some amaretto in there. Um, a little bit of like imitation vanilla just to round things out and then top it off with some club soda. Um, and it is very, very tasty. Yeah, I, I tried it and you told me all the things that were in it. And I'm like, this is weird. And <laughs> But when when you taste it, you get all of those things. You get the cinnamon, you get the amaretto, you get the vanilla. You don't, you don't have Knob Creek in your recipe that you sent to me. Yeah, I do. Blame it on the a- 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 alcohol. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> Um, but you get you get a little bit of that maple giving that brown sweetness. You taste all of it, but it all kind of weirdly works together. Yeah, like you said, it's kind of like like an horchata without the, creaminess. the creaminess. You know. Yeah. I guess if you wanted, you could almost make like a like white Russian version of this and replace the club soda with like some sure. heavy cream or something. Um, and I'm sure that would taste delicious. So. Um, yeah, that's what I've got drinking today. I also took a shot of. Another Christmas present. My lovely fiance got me a bottle oh, of blackened. <laughs> <laughs> no, stay in. Uh, got me a bottle of blackened, which is uh, Metallica's whiskey. Uh, like they didn't make it, but they like teamed up with somebody to have this made. Uh, the whiskey is stored in black brandy barrels, mm-hmm. with Metallica music being played against the barrels. Uh, yeah. Different batches have different playlists to kind of the vibrations let more of the wood touch the alcohol and uh, flavor it in different ways is the overall goal. Yeah. Um, the idea behind it is like if you have differing sound waves, the different vibrations will produce different patterns. And in theory, each batch would be unique in the flavor profile because you have different sound waves, different amount of sound waves. So, so. it's interesting. Yeah, they kind of want you to be like a whiskey Pokemon master and catch them all, I guess. Um, what What's the batch number that you have? Is I have like batch number 87. Uh, Lars Ulrich made the playlist that mine has or was made under. And uh, it's it's very tasty. It's smooth. It's got a little bit of a different taste to it because of the like brandy barrel you know, that it's been in. Yeah. So start off with that and then working on the cocktail. And I've mm. also got a spotted cow in front of me just in case. So Three this cups. is going to be a fun, fun episode. Yeah. My dear, what is in your cup? I have a bottle of Stone Arch Vanilla Stout. So Stone Arch is a brew, brewery, brew pub out of Appleton, Wisconsin. And we were talking last week how I give five stars too easily to my beers on Untapped. And yeah, this is another five star. Oh, you don't say. It, yeah. <laughs> um, so last week I had the Java Lava and I like the coffee flavor in that one. And this Vanilla Stout, I think it has even more coffee flavor than that one. And again, it's a dark beer. It's a Vanilla Stout, but it's very light, easily drinkable. So I'm giving it five stars. It's got really good roasted flavors. Kind of reminds me of coffee. It's kind of sweet. I don't get a lot of vanilla, but it has a really good flavor all around. So I, I like stars. how much body it has to it. Um, I'm more of a porter fan than a stout fan usually um, because I like those fuller bodied beers where I feel stouts can sometimes be a little bit thinner, but okay. definitely more bitter. Yeah. Um, however, yeah. that stout definitely has a fuller body to it and I really like it. Yeah, and yeah, it, it does have a little bit of the bitter notes, but again, that reminds me of coffee, so but, uh, yeah, I'm yeah, digging yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, the bitter's not bad, just, you know, I like it. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, now that we've tried to um, lighten the mood before we get heavy here. Wait, I have something else to lighten the mood. Okay. I had an idea. Okay, what you got? Have you ever heard of, like, the game, like, Concentration? Where you have like a category. Is that the little thing where it like shakes and then it like... No, that's perfection. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. That's perfection. Which scared the crap out of me when I was younger. <laughs> but anyway. Different story okay, in a different podcast. <laughs> um, it's like you, you have a category and you go back and forth and say things that fit within that category. And like the first person who can't think of something like loses. Okay. So I thought the movie that we're about to talk about, An American Crime, we are watching it and realized how many now famous stars are in it yeah so i thought we could play concentration real quick back and forth and see if we can list stars of the movie do you have a list of i have a list don't look at it don't look at it don't cheat can you like yeah i'll I'll put my hand up like this i'll have a blinder on (laughs) 
do do you want to go first then? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to go with Scott Eastwood. Okay. I'm going to go with Ellen Page. Okay. I'm going to go with James Franco. Uh, Catherine Keener. I'm going to go with Haley McFarland. You just made that up. No, she was <laughs> actually on the TV show Lie to Me. She played uh, the daughter. Okay, okay. I'm going to go with Evan Peters. Is oh, that his name? Yes. <laughs> That's the freaking last one I remember. <laughs> yeah, because that's the last one I remember, too. I don't remember Wait, anything. Um, oh, no, 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 no. Damn it. I just looked, so I can't do it. But uh, I, there was one more. The guy from Twilight. Um, yeah, sorry. So get into the story. I just... Okay. <laughs> so the first movie I'm going to talk about is... Uh, and, and I'm not going to talk about both these movies in like entire length. Because that would definitely make this podcast super long. And we don't want to hurt your ears that much. So the first movie is American Crime. It's... Uh, Rated R it was released at the Sundance Festival on January 19th, 2007. However, it didn't get released again until it was uh, it was a TV release. It was released on Showtime. Oh, really? Uh, May 10th, 2008. Okay. So that's the first time that it was kind of like that's it's like public release, you know, okay. kind of out in the uh, mainstream, stream, right? More or less. I guess if you happen to be at Sundance in 2007, you might have got a chance to see it a year and a half before everybody else. But okay, uh, James the, Franco. What's that? <laughs> I said, okay, James Franco. Right. Runtime was 98 minutes. Uh, it was distributed by Showtime. Uh, it was filmed in Los Angeles, California. As we talked about, it starred Ellen Page as the uh, namesake Sylvia Likens of this episode. Uh, Catherine Keener as Gertrude Beneszewski. Evan Peters as Ricky Hobbs. In addition to those three people, uh, we, there's also small roles by James Franco, Scott Eastwood, Haley McFarlane, and Kuma the Dog, oh. who was a dog actor who lived from 2001 to 2018. 17 year old oh. dog, um, and acted for most of his life. He cool. acted from 2005 to 2017. Wow. So that's 12 years. Yeah, that's Aww. pretty crazy. Yeah. Good so, job, Kuma. <clears throat> yeah. Interesting little tidbit there. Oh, I like it. <clears throat> the story so, needs a lot of happy, yeah, little fun yeah, tidbits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of the last one. So, um, oh. <laughs> so the oh. following is an interpretation of events based on Beneszewski versus the state of Indiana, 1966. That, that, that was the first title card we're greeted to. Second title card says, all testimony comes from court transcripts. So the opening scene is of a courtroom. There's a trial in progress. So much like the movie Bomb City that we talked about a couple weeks ago, uh, this movie makes use of the courtroom testimony as kind of a narrative device to set up scenes, which you'll you'll see, you know, people are asked questions and then the next scene details kind of what goes on in that question. So during this opening scene, we see photos of evidence and then we hear the questioning of Lester Likens, uh, who is Sylvia Likens' dad. Uh, which sets up our movie. So we flash back to July 1965. Lester, like I said, Sylvia Likens' dad, wants Betty, uh, Sylvia Likens' mother, to run a uh, their own booth for the carnival and go on the carnival, I guess, state fair circuit. They attended Bethany Baptist Church. Sylvia has a sister named Jenny who has polio and wears braces for that reason. And they go to church with a lady named Gertrude Banaszewski, who has seven kids. There's Stephanie, Paula, Shirley, Johnny, Marie, Patty, and little Kenny. So Lester and Betty end up leaving their daughters with Gertrude to go do this circuit because they don't want to take the, do the girls with them. They've still got school, things like that. And Gertrude is, you know, needing money, so they agree to pay her $20 a week to watch after their kids. So, now we're in August 1965. Uh, the girls actually start a new school on the south side of town due to them living with Gertrude. Uh, we also see Andy, who's played by James Franco. He is the father of Gertrude's youngest, uh, little Kenny. He comes to visit Gertrude to let her know that he's been called up for Vietnam. So then we go back to the courtroom where uh, Gertrude's neighbor is on the witness stand and uh, just asking, you know, hey, did you ever hear anything? And she's like, yeah, we heard stuff, but we didn't, we're kind of afraid to say anything. Um, but what I took away was that she gave 3848 East New York as the address, uh, as her address, and I believe 3850 was the address for Gertrude's house then. Mm -hmm. So then we flash back to 1965. Paula found out that she's pregnant. 
and confides in Sylvia. Uh, the next day, Gertrude takes Sylvia and Jenny down to the basement and t- tells the girls that their daddy's check didn't arrive because he only paid her for one week up front and then was going to mail the rest of the checks. Mm-hmm. She says that she thinks that they left them for good with her and they're basically he, they're trying to screw her over. Um, so Gertrude starts to starts to whip him. Jenny collapses after getting spanked once, and when Gertrude tells her to get up for more, Sylvia says that she will take Jenny's spankings too because she's the older sister and you know wants to look out for her sister. So the next day, the check arrives. Hmm. Uh, that night, Paula and Sylvia go to hang out with some kids from school who are drinking. Paula ends up getting into an argument with the married guy whose kid she is pregnant with because mm-hmm. he wants to break it off. I don't think she ever told him that she was pregnant. Uh, In the movie, at least. Um, So then Paula goes home upset, to which Gertrude asks what's going on. Instead of telling her mom, like, hey, I'm pregnant. It's a married guy's thing. Like, uh, she basically says Sylvia is spreading lies about her at school. Like, calling her a slut and things like that. So then we go back to the courtroom. Marie, one of the Banaszewski's kids, they ask her if she ever remembers Sylvia using profanity. Or if she recalls how often Sylvia went to church. Um, so then we go back to 1965 uh, as Banaszewski and the Lykins are leaving church. Gertrude makes Jenny come sit by her on the ho- bus ride home. Uh, when they return home, Gertrude calls a family meeting and makes Sylvia apologize to Paula and then gives Paula the right to get revenge on Sylvia. So she has Johnny hold Sylvia's arms while Paula slaps her in the face and then tackles her to the ground. So the next month, September 1965, a uh, rumor is flying around school that Paula is pregnant. Jenny finds uh, the note that came with their dad's first check in the trash, and it has a phone number for the girls to be able to reach them on it. So Jenny and Sylvia call their parents, who let them know that they will actually be back in two weeks. Sylvia and Jenny get spotted on the phone by Gertrude's kids. Uh, so when they get home, Sylvia gets approached by Gertrude, uh, and she asks her where she got the money to make the call and who they were calling. Sylvia gives an answer that, you know, she had found some bottles, internal men, got recycling fee on it. Um, However, Gertrude accuses Sylvia of stealing the money and puts a cigarette out on her hand. So we go back to the courtroom. Marie's on the witness stand and says that Paula was jealous of Sylvia. So then we go back to 1965. (laughs) There's a lot of back and back. Uh, The Banaszewskis and the Likens kids are at a church picnic. The rumor mill is running at full capacity and everybody is pointing at Sylvia uh, as the rumor starter. Then we get back to the house and Sylvia gets dropped off by Eric, who is the small role played by Scott Eastwood. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gertrude accuses her of spreading more lies about Paula. Then we go to the courtroom and Patty, one of the younger girls, is on the witness stand and she's saying that Gertrude then made Sylvia take an empty Coke bottle, um, lift her, her skirt and put it inside of her. So we get flashback to 1965, and we're in the room as that demand was just made. So Sylvia does what Gertrude has demanded of her. And then afterwards, she tells the other kids to put Sylvia in the basement. When Sylvia shows a little resistance to wanting to go down into the basement, uh, they, they just push her down the stairs. Um, Sylvia is shown waking a little while later, uh, laying on the basement floor, bleeding from the head. It appears that Sylvia has other injuries also because she's unable to, like sit up or like Mm -hmm. move herself and never really says what injuries she had. So upstairs, Gertrude lets Jenny know that her parents actually picked up another leg of the circuit in Florida and won't be back until the end of November. And granted we're in September right now. So we go back to the courtroom. Patty's still on the witness stand and uh, the defense attorney asked if Sylvia ever talked back or, and Patty says no, that she usually just apologized and did what she was told. And he asked if she saw anyone else do anything to Sylvia during the month of September. So we shoot back to 1965 and Johnny, one of the Banaszewski kids, is leading four teens downstairs, showing off Sylvia almost like a a prize. Um, Johnny kicks her, burns her with a cigarette. And then Johnny, Patty, and Marie encourage the four teens to grab a cigarette and burn her as well. So back in the courtroom, Patty states that she saw kids burning Sylvia every day. Punching her in the face, the kids encouraged and invited neighborhood kids over to torture Sylvia. Uh, She was punched, kicked, soaked with a hose, humiliated, and tied up. And Patty says that her mother was there overseeing the majority of this. So back to 1965, it's October 23rd, 1965. This is the first time in the movie that we're given like an exact date. Mm -hmm. 
Um, after discovering Paula is pregnant and receiving a visit from the Reverend, Gertrude tells everyone to go to the basement. She tells Johnny to hold Sylvia while Gertrude and the rest of the kids burn a brand into Sylvia's stomach that reads, I'm a prostitute and proud of it. Later, Paula comes down to try to help Sylvia escape. The Paula that kind of started all this. Mm -hmm. Sylvia can barely walk. Patty spots Paula taking Sylvia out the door and wakes up Gertrude. Gertrude comes outside, but Paula holds her up while Sylvia tries to flee. As she collapses in the backyard and Ricky grabs her, they get her in a car and drive to where they think her parents are at. As she's looking for her parents at the fair carnival, uh, she had to pass under a tent banner that read, Defies Death and Alive, which I thought was just kind of clever. Well, yeah, I didn't notice that. <laughs> she finds her parents and tells them what happened. They get in the car and drive back to Gertrude's house where her parents just let her let her go back into the, like, the mouth of the beast all by herself. Well, yeah, they're like, you know, you want to just stay in the car. You don't have to go back in there. And she was like, no, I need to face this head on or something like right, that. Right, right. But they, I don't know. It was just kind of like, oh, we're not going to go with her. So as she walks in, we hear Stephanie yell that she's not breathing. And at this point, I guess we kind of realize that the whole escape thing was just sort of a like a dream a Mother hallucination fucking dream sequence yeah so to stephanie's claim that she's not breathing gertrude says ah she's faking so sylvia is laying dead on the kitchen floor this is october 26th 1965 is the date they were given sylvia's laying dead on the kitchen floor gertrude keeps saying that she's faking it and all of the kids are freaking out ricky calls the cops when they arrive jenny walks up and asks to be taken away immediately then we go back to the courtroom Jenny's on the witness stand. The lawyer's asking if Sylvia ever did anything to any of the Banachewskis. Uh, she says no. He asks why Jenny didn't do anything. She says that Gertrude had told her uh, she would get the tr same treatment if she told anyone. Then we're told that the trial lasted 24 days. Gertrude was the last one to take the stand. Then on the stand, Gertrude states that she was on the medicines Corsetin and Phenobarbital Sulfate, uh, which I made a couple notes about. Phenobarbital sulfate is an anti-seizure medication. Um, it's a central nervous system depressant, um, which some ana antihistamines are CNS depressants. I know, like, during the movie, it kind of shows that she was taking this stuff for, like, a cold or something. Like, she was claiming her she was sick. So I don't know if maybe they did that or maybe she had seizures, what the case was for her taking the phenobarbital. Um, however, side effects of phenobarbital include a decreased level of consciousness along with a decreased effort to breathe. Interesting. Um, Coracetin, De go ahead. Decreased effort to breathe? Like it's right? supposed to make it easier to breathe? That's what I, so I thought okay. maybe that's why like they gave in, she's having like coughing issues or so something like that. I'll uh, jump ahead. In real life, uh, Gertrude Renischewski was an asthmatic, so she had asthma. So maybe that's why maybe they gave it to why. her, yeah, yeah, to help her. Interesting. Be able to breathe, which and also, which is why she often had like coughing fits. I think whenever she did anything like physical. Okay. So. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then coracetin includes uh, dextromethorphan, which is commonly used as an expectorant in cough medicine, and chlorpheniramine, uh, which is an antihistamine. So, the side effects of the D word, um, <laughs> I nailed it once, I'm not going to say it again, <laughs> are diarrhea and hallucinations. Okay. Um, in high doses, the D word acts as a dissociative anesthetic, producing dissociative hallucinogenic states similar to ketamine or PCP. Hmm. Uh, for this reason, the D-word is commonly used as a recreational drug. However, long-term recreational abuse of dextromethorphan can result in psychosis and erectile dysfunction. I don't think she had that issue. Oh, I thought that may maybe that's why she was pissed off. Um, <laughs> so anyway. She couldn't get her D-word up. <laughs> right. So not, not, to, not to give her any sort of compassion excuse? or excuse yeah. at all. But if she was using these heavily, it could have created a, a level of psychosis, which definitely a tri like helped w along with this. And to your point, to kind of go along with that, um, I read in the court transcripts that she said that she couldn't afford to go to the doctor. So she was kind of taking these things of her own accord. So she wasn't being monitored on how much she was taking mm. or how frequently she was taking it. So right. there's and that aspect to it. Like phenobarbital is... Uh, it can't. It doesn't create a physical addiction. However, I've, I saw that it can create a like psychological 
uh, reliance on the drug. Hmm. And then, you know, the the D word also <laughs> uh, creates an addictive sort of thing. Okay. In high doses. So Gertrude, uh, still on the stand, claims that her kids were fighting other kids, that her kids and the neighbor kids were fighting Sylvia. She claims that she didn't see any of the fights and that she didn't personally make any marks on Sylvia. The lawyer asks if the if she heard all of her children admit that they watched her do all of these things, and she called all of her children liars on the stand. <laughs> There's a voiceover by Ellen Page at this point, uh, which I'm pretty sure isn't true to the story because at this point she's dead. But playing Sylvia, she says she sacrificed me to protect her children and sacrificed them to protect herself. So... You didn't mention this in the movie, but she went down to Sylvia at one point and was saying to her, like, I can't have you spreading rumors about my kids. She was she was kind of crying, and I don't think there's any evidence support to support that this exchange actually happened, but she was, like, crying, and she was like, I don't know if she ever said the words I'm sorry, but kind of like, I'm sorry for doing this to you, but you have to understand, like, I have no choice. You're... I can't have you saying these things about my kids and spreading rumors. So it's like, this is why I have to do this to you type of a thing. Granted, like to this level is not, I get the other word, but it's not um, necessary. And so I think that's why there was that quote where Sylvia said uh, she sacrificed my, me to save her children. Gotcha. Which I think that's the way that she, like Gertrude. So I don't again, that yeah. this is all like fictional and at I, this point and you're right i didn't include that because like you said i, I didn't yeah, think it no maybe really... there was any way to prove that yeah we have one woman that's probably like in a certain state of psychosis versus another woman that you know is dead was tortured to death so in the end the jury found gertrude banishevsky guilty of first degree murder and sentenced her to life in prison paula was found guilty and sent spent a couple years in prison Johnny was also found guilty and was the youngest inmate in Indiana State Reformatory. Ricky was found guilty of manslaughter and went to prison. He died at the age of 21 from lung cancer. Uh, And Gertrude only served 20 years of her sentence before being paroled. And then she died five years later. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's an American crime. Like I said, we've got two movies here. The other one is The Girl Next Door. Uh, it's rated R, released October 3rd, 2007. Uh, runtime was 91 minutes. I found it interesting that it was distributed by Stars, which is another, you know, Star Showtime HBO right. sort of thing. It was filmed in Fort Lee, New Jersey. So in this movie, the Lycan sisters are known as Meg Laughlin and Susan Laughlin. None of the real names are used here. This is supposed to be based on a book by Hal Ketchum. I guess it was more inspired by than the actual true story. This story is much more sexual in nature, whereas I feel that in American Crime, it was very physical. You know, they beat her, they, like, tortured her, they burned her. This one, it's very, like, hypersexual. You know, they're, like, calling her a slut Uh and wanting to touch her. She gets, you know, Mm -hmm. we'll get into it. So, in this movie, Meg meets David uh, as a young boy. He's fishing for crayfish when she walks down the river. And the story starts in 1955, right? Like, it's not even the same year. It's Right. Supposedly right. takes place 10 years before. Right. Good catch. So she says that she is from New York, and her and her parents were in an accident, um, and that she's staying with her Aunt Ruth uh, Chandler, uh, to which David responds, they're neighbors. So in this one, you know, it wasn't her parents living for a carnival. It was that her parents died, and they're actually staying with a family member. So, David says an interesting fact about crayfish is that sometimes they eat their own kind, which I took as major foreshadowing. Uh, Susan, which is Jenny in this movie, Sylvia Likens' sister, also has braces, but these are from the accident, not from polio. So, David calls Meg's Aunt Ruth one of the gang with with the next scene showing that Ruth entertains neighborhood boys gives them beer and cigarettes and was talking to them about like dancing girls and stuff which is similar to an american crime where gertrude was you know giving beer and cigarettes to the neighborhood boys so the next scene shows meg meeting david at like some waterfront area and he's ordering some food she asks if she can have one because ruth hasn't fed her in two days much like an american crime the caretaker in this story uh, projects a lot of her flaws, mistakes, and like poor self-image on the Sylvia character, um, whether it be Sylvia in American Crime or Meg here, uh, causing her to like verbally humiliate and degrade. 
So the next day, Dave comes over, finds three of the boys tickling Meg. When one of them grabs Meg in an inappropriate spot, uh, she slaps the boy, Ralphie. Aunt Ruth comes upstairs, asks Susan, who was locked in the closet, why she didn't stop Meg from hitting Ralphie. She tells her that she's just as guilty for not stopping her. So she drags Susan to the end of the bed, pulls her skirt up, pulls her panties down, and like just beats her bare ass with a toilet brush. And then Ruth rips Meg's mom's ring from around her neck that she was wearing because her mom died in the accident. You know, sentimental stuff. Uh, so the next day to picnic, Meg is spotted talking to a police officer by the boys. Um, Ruth says that something must be done to keep Meg from going to the cops every day. So a couple nights later, David goes in the Chandler house and finds that Meg has been tied up in the basement with Ruth and all the kids trying to make her confess to something secret. She's blindfolded, gagged, her like wrists are tied up above her head. Um, she's standing on books and they keep like removing a book to put more pressure on her wrists. They decide to strip her, and Ruth gives her approval for this to happen. So Willie cuts all of Meg's clothes off. Uh, meanwhile, her sister's watching everything. They strip her completely nude before telling her to confess all the sexual things that she's done. So they berate her. Willie goes to touch her before Ruth stops him, saying that she is dirty and no one is to touch her. So they put a gag back in her mouth before leaving her naked and strung up downstairs. That night, the boys sneak downstairs and give her water. Uh, they tell her that they'll let her arms down if... She lets them touch her down there. She does not agree to that, so they leave, but not before David puts a little slack in the ropes. Uh, the next morning, the boys come downstairs, find Ruth trying to feed Meg a piece of toast, but Meg is, like, too dehydrated to eat. She keeps, like, kind of choking. Um, at one point, like, Meg knocks over a cup and it breaks, so Ruth bends Susan over and spanks her because of Meg's mistake. She then asks that every time Meg messes up and disobeys, that they will beat Susan instead of her. So the next day, David finds the Chandler kids, plus more of the neighborhood kids, kind of pushing Meg around, treating her like a punching bag. As they go upstairs, Willie stays downstairs and gropes Meg before he runs upstairs. The next day, Ruth is watching as the boys are cutting Meg with a knife. Uh, when one of them cuts a little bit too far, she says they have to cauterize it, so she walks over and burns her with her cigarette. Um, David sneaks downstairs one day and gives Meg a pocket knife. Uh, he then leaves some money under a rock in the woods for her to escape. After a couple days, he checks back and the money is still there. So he goes over to the Chandlers and see, sees Ruth watching Willie, the older son, rape Meg. There's a group of kids downstairs watching. Like, there's a whole crowd of people, even like some girls. Um, Ruth asks who else wants to take a turn with her. The youngest, Ralphie, suggests that they don't rape her, but they cut something into her. To which Ruth approves. So Ruth heats up a bobby pin and burns into Meg's stomach the words, I fuck, fuck me, because she doesn't want any man to want her. Um, but she doesn't stop there. While she's got this crowd, she says that, you know, while no man may want her, she may still want a man, and basically decides to, I looked it up to see exactly what they were trying to perform. So they perform a crude clitorectomy. Oh my God. Um, she basically, like, turns on a propane torch and burns... Meg's clitoris off the like fuck? yeah completely that way no man would ever want her and she would also have no desire to oh be with God. a man I'm glad I didn't watch this yeah. movie yeah Jeez. so um after that everybody kind of goes away David stays starts a fire downstairs as Ruth comes downstairs to investigate and he knocks her out with one of Susan's crutches the police arrive to find Meg Susan and David downstairs the police take Susan upstairs um, however, before they come back downstairs, Meg dies. Um, and that was the whole movie. There was no wrap-up. There was no... Trial or anything. Trial, anything like that. Um, the police officer like kind of took the pulse of Ruth at one point and just kind of had like a weird face. You couldn't tell if she was dead or not. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it just kind of just kind of ended like real abruptly. Hmm. So, um, weird. Like I said, this movie was definitely like inspired by this yeah. case. I wanted to watch it and put it on here because I don't know much about the story, but I kind of felt that there may be more to the story than is detailed in an American crime. And since this one definitely seemed like other end of the spectrum, I figured maybe detailing both would cover a lot of it. So that's where we're at. You want to tell us the true story? Yep. I'll get into it. Okay. Any comments you want to make about the movie or anything? Sorry. Um. 
Yeah. Just like the whole um, dream sequence in an American crime was very emotional. Even though I was familiar with the story of Sylvia Likens before we watched the movies, I saw that and I was like hopeful and I was like, oh, maybe she did, like, maybe I missed something in the original story and, like, maybe she got to see her parents one last time and, like, maybe she had the hope of, like, making it out and then she walks in and you realize that, like, she, her real self is, like, on the kitchen floor, like, dead. It was, um, just, like, really hard to watch. It's heavy. Yeah. And I had heard the story in the past, but just, like, seeing it. So it's, like, even though you know that they're actors, but just, like, seeing some of the actions being done on a human being, it's just, like, yeah, it's heavy and it's just, like... Yeah, yeah, still unbelievable. You know, we've talked a lot about humanity this weekend, and it's it's crazy. So Sylvia Marie Likens was born on January third, nineteen forty nine, to Lester and Betty Likens. She was the third child born to the couple, being born between two sets of fraternal twins, Diana and Daniel, and Benny Ray and Jenny Fay. <laughs> wow! Can't, can't make that up. <laughs> Which I thought was interesting. In the movie they made it seem like. Uh, she had one sister, yeah. Yep, it was just the two of them. But And I thought that was interesting that the other siblings were like two sets of twins. And she was like the, she was literally like the middle child. Right. So like it was portrayed in the movie, Lester and Betty were carnival workers. And often the family's home life was unstable. The couple fought and moved frequently. Often Jenny and Sylvia were boarded out or forced to live with their relatives while their parents were on the road. To help with the family finances, which were often tight, Sylvia would do things like babysitting and ironing, which kind of, I thought was kind of ironic. It's a lot of like the work that Bertrude Bertrude. Gertrude did in the American (laughs) crime movie. Yeah, Yeah. Gertrude did. Then in July of 1965, Sylvia and Jenny were living with their mother as their parents were separated. At this point, the oldest daughter, Diana, had moved out and was married. The two boys, Daniel and Benny Ray, were living with their grandparents. Um, Their mother, Betty, was arrested and sent to jail for shoplifting. While she was in jail, Lester found the two girls at Gertrude's house playing with her children. Betty was released from jail after one night, and she reunited with Lester, and they decided to go back on the road uh, to work for the carnival. And so Lester arranged for them to stay with Gertrude Banachewski, who was the mother of their new friend, Paula. So kind of like in the movie, you know, we kind of got a glimpse into the fact that the parents were separated and they kind of like came back together and decided to go back out on the road for the carnival. But not shown in the movie was the fact that Betty had been arrested and had spent the night in jail for shoplifting. Right. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. At this point, Gertrude was divorced from her first husband, John, and had a total of seven children. Uh, Paula, 17. Stephanie, who was 15. John, who was 12. Marie, who was 11. Shirley, who was 10. John Jr., who was eight, and Dennis Lee Wright Jr., who was less than a a year old. So after Gertrude had divorced from her husband, she moved in with 22-year-old Dennis Lee Wright, who abused her. She had one child with Dennis Lee Wright, which was, of course, Dennis Lee Wright Jr., and the other six were with her first husband, John. Also, I noticed, like, (laughs) she had two children named John. Right. One was John and the other was John Jr. And in some sources, I saw that he was called like James or Jimmy. So I don't know what his name really was. I I just want to believe that she just had two kids named John. That's weird because uh, instead of Dennis, they had a little Kenny. Mm-hmm. And instead of the other John, they had Patty. Oh, I thought Patty was a girl. It, Patty was a girl in the movie. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. So what were the kids' names that you had? I, I was trying to keep track. Paula, uh-huh. Stephanie, yep. Shirley, yep. Johnny, yep. Marie, mm-hmm. Patty, and Little Kenny. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. maybe the movie like <laughs> writers were confused as well, and they're just like... That well, or maybe those two girl. being the youngest, I'm assuming they're still alive at this point, maybe they didn't give their rights for their names to be used in this movie. Fair enough. Whereas, I mean, as we heard at the bottom of the case like some of these other people have died maybe they you know whatever the case anyway go ahead and i did see that um the baby dennis lee wright was um adopted by another family and they changed his name but they like changed his name from dennis to denny so i don't know if it's so much a name change just like a nickname interesting um and i think the other children were adopted as well okay some of the younger ones i don't know though um yeah for some of the younger children because i do have some of the like what happened afterwards good um some of the children they don't have a lot of information on 
So after the birth of their baby, uh, Dennis Lee Wright actually left Gertrude. So the character played by James Franco uh, probably didn't play as big of a role. Not that he played a big role in the case, but um, he wasn't really present while all this was going on. Gertrude told a lot of people that he had to be stationed in Germany for the army or something, which kind of reminded me of how you said. The Vietnam thing. Yeah. Yeah. And just like in the movie, uh, Lester Likens agreed to pay Gertrude $20 a week to care for the girls. Okay. Banaszewski beat both girls uh, when the weekly check arrived late, but soon focused all of her abuse on Sylvia. Um, like in the movie, Jenny did have polio, but it's not clear if that played into why Banaszewski shifted her focus to Sylvia. I really didn't see anything about if that whole Sylvia saying, you know, I'll take her hits for right. her was actually happened. Okay. Um, and according to his court testimony, uh, Lester and Betty Likens had visited the girls at various times uh, between when they were dropped off in early July and that first week of October. Uh, when they visited, they didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, but they also didn't look at any rooms other than pretty much the living room. Um, so they basically would like visit the girls for like half an hour whenever they were in town and just would like see them in the living room and pay Gertrude. Crazy. Yeah. So I want to say the court testimonies are still available online. Um, I found them on a website, sylvialikens.com. They have all of them sorted by witness, I guess, on the witness stand. So okay. you can go through and read them if you'd like. I'm, I'm about to get into um, the beatings that happened to Sylvia. And I'm just going to say right now, the true story, in my opinion, is a lot worse than what was depicted in the movie. So... I'm going to get into um, some of the details about what happened to Sylvia now. If you feel you don't want to listen to the details, please skip forward to 53 minutes and 25 seconds. Banaszewski, as I said, soon focused her abuse exclusively on Sylvia. She accused her of stealing candy that she had bought and humiliated her when she admitted that she once had a boyfriend. Banaszewski's daughter, which in the movie they kept like bringing up like boys in California or something like that. And the Likens family did briefly move out to California and then had moved back to uh, Indianapolis area. Okay. Banaszewski's daughter, Paula, who was pregnant at the time, kicked Likens in the genitals and accused her of being pregnant. Banaszewski began allowing her older children to beat Likens and repeatedly pushed her down the stairs for entertainment. During a church function, Banaszewski force-fed Likens a hot dog overloaded with condiments. Likens vomited afterwards, which she was later forced to consume. Likens was later accused of spreading rumors at school that Paul and Stephanie Banaszewski were prostitutes. This supposedly provoked Stephanie's boyfriend, Coy Hubbard, to physically attack Likens. Hubbard and his classmates soon made frequent visits to the Banaszewski residence to torment Likens, often collaborating with Banaszewski's own children and Banaszewski herself. With Banaszewski's encouragement, they routinely beat her, forced her to eat feces and drink urine, used her as a practice dummy in violent judo sessions, lacerated her, burnt her body with lit cigarettes over 100 times, and severely injured her genitals. To entertain Gertrude and her teenage accomplices, Likens was forced to strip naked in the living room and insert an empty Coca-Cola bottle into her own vagina, which was depicted in the movie. Yeah. Paula Banaszewski once beat Likens in the face with such force that she broke her own wrist. She later had to wear a cast, which she used to further beat Likens. Gertrude Banaszewski later forced Jenny to hit her sister, beating her if she did not comply. Um, I read Jenny's transcript on this, and, you know, the lawyer asked her, did you ever hit Sylvia? And she said, yeah, once or twice. And they were like, well, what happened? And she said, uh, Gertrude forced her to hit her, like, once. And when she did, Gertrude said it wasn't hard enough, so she forced her to hit her again. And then after that, she didn't hit her any other times. Hmm. Meanwhile, Raymond and Phyllis Vermillion, a middle-aged couple who moved next door, saw Gertrude to be an ideal caretaker for their own two children. Uh, they visited the Banaszewski residence on two occasions, where they witnessed Paula, with Gertrude's approval, abusing Likens and boasting about it in front of them. Needless to say, they did not go with Gertrude as a babysitter. Banaszewski eventually forbade Likens from attending school after Likens confessed to having stolen a gym suit from the school and Banaszewski would not buy a gym suit for her. She brutally beat and whipped Sylvia and did the same for Jenny after remembering that she supposedly stole a tennis shoe. Banaszewski then switched to the topic to, quote, the evils of premarital sex and brutally kicked Sylvia repeatedly in the genitals. She also burned all of her fingers with matches and further whipped her. Likens eventually became incontinent due to the severity of the torture. She was denied access to the bathroom and so was forced to wet herself. As punishment for her incontinence, Banaszewski threw her in the basement and locked her in. 
Throughout her captivity, Banaszewski frequently, with the assistance of her children and their friends, restrained lichens in a bathtub filled with scalding water and rubbed salt into her burns. She was often kept naked and rarely fed. At times, Banaszewski and her 12-year-old son, John Jr., would make lichens eat her own feces, as well as urine and feces from the diaper of Gertrude Banaszewski's one-year-old son. She also made abusing lichens a pastime, charging the neighborhood children five cents to see the, quote, display of lichens naked body and tie, beat, and burn and mutilate her. Hmm. Lichens attempted to alert the neighbors for help by screaming and hitting the walls of the basement with a spade, ultimately to no avail. And in Phyllis Vermillion's testimony, she said she could hear the sound of, like, scraping on the basement walls and screaming, but didn't report anything. The Lycan sisters had no way to contact other family members to inform them of the abuse. So in the movie where they had their parents' phone number, um, that likely isn't the case because they moved around so much from carnival to carnival. So um, they had no way to contact their family members. Jenny especially struggled to do this since she was constantly threatened by Banaszewski that she would be abused and tortured next like her sister. She was also bullied by the neighborhood girls and beaten whenever she alluded to Sylvia's situation. Nonetheless, they encountered Diana, their older and married sister, at the local park. I just want to say, this was one thing that wasn't shown in the, or I guess different than the movie. So kind of in the movie, I feel like they showed that Sylvia was trapped in the basement all the time and not allowed to leave. But I don't think that was necessarily the case, which almost makes it crazier that, like, people didn't see, like, bruises and, like, marks on her and say something. So, um, I take it that, uh, Sylvia and Jenny were at a park and they saw their older sister, Diana. Diana was forbidden by her parents to make contact with the sisters due to her estrangement. So I think there was some turmoil between Diana and her parents. So her parents were like, you're not allowed to see your sisters. So Diana initially assumed that the punishments that Sylvia and Jenny were receiving were related to this. Neither party was aware that they lived less than a mile and a half apart. So at first, Diana... I think I saw this in an article or a transcript or something, but she said she initially thought that the girls were just like, you know, being teenagers and complaining about like having to live at this other woman's house. So she was like, oh, it's like, it's not that bad. They're just exaggerating and, you know, being teenagers. Yeah. They thought they were being dramatic. Yeah, exactly. So Diana eventually learned that Sylvia and Jenny were staying at a stranger's home and she attempted to visit them. Upon her visit, Banaszewski told Diana, unaware of who Banaszewski was, that the Lycan sisters... So I think that's supposed to be Banaszewski didn't know, didn't realize who Diana was. Um, but she told her that the Lycan sisters were not allowed to see her and ordered her off her property. At one point, Diana secretly gave a starving Sylvia a sandwich. Sylvia remained silent about the matter, but after Marie Banaszewski revealed it, Paul and Gertrude choked and paddled Sylvia before subjecting her to another scalding bath. Shortly thereafter, a neighbor made an anonymous report, which prompted an in-home visit by a public health nurse. So not a priest, as shown in the movie. But the nurse entered the home and made inquiries, but had no choice but to leave without further investigation. She told Banaszewski the report was about lichens. Banaszewski replied that she had kicked lichens out of her house and that her whereabouts were unknown. The nurse had no way of knowing that the subject of her inquiry was right below her in the basement. Hmm. Likens was often deprived of water. Jenny later speculated during her court testimony mm-hmm. that Likens was unable to produce tears due to dehydration, as I think that was uh, the line in the movie as well. Hmm. On October 22nd, Likens was forced by John to eat a bowl of soup with her fingers. John quickly took away the bowl when Likens attempted to eat it. Banaszewski eventually allowed her to sleep upstairs under the condition that she learned not to wet herself. That night, Likens whispered to Jenny to give her a glass of water before falling asleep. On October 23rd, Banaszewski discovered that Likens had urinated herself. As punishment, Likens was forced to masturbate with an empty glass Coca-Cola bottle in front of Banaszewski's children. After that, she stripped Likens naked and carved the words, I'm a prostitute and proud of it, into Likens' abdomen with a heated needle. Mm -hmm. When Banaszewski was unable to finish the branding, she had Richard Hobbs finish. And like I said, uh, Banaszewski was asthmatic, and she, in the movie they showed her like having a coughing fit and couldn't finish it, so she asked Richie to finish. So it sounds like that's what happened in real life. Hmm. Um, Hobbs continued to brand Likens as Banaszewski calmly took Jenny to the grocery store. Hobbs and 10-year-old Shirley Banaszewski then used an iron poker in an attempt to burn the letter S into Likens' chest. The burn scar ended up looking like a number three. Banaszewski later taunted Likens about how she would never be able to marry a man due to the words carved into her stomach. Likens was taken back to the basement where Coy Hubbard arrived to tie her up and slam her body against the wall six to seven times. That night, Likens confided to her sister, I'm going to die. I can tell. 
The next day, Banaszewski woke Likens, then dictated a letter to her, intending to mislead her parents into believing that she had run away. The letter also tried to frame a group of anonymous boys for abusing and mutilating Likens after she supposedly agreed to have sexual relations with them. Jesus Christ. After Likens finished the letter, Banaszewski formulated a plan to have John Jr. and Jenny take Sylvia to a nearby forested area and leave her there to die. On October 25th, Likens tried to escape after overhearing Banaszewski's plan to blindfold her and dump her body in Jimmy's Forest, a wooded area nearby. Likens fled to the front door, but due to her extensive injuries, Banaszewski caught her in time. Likens was provided with toast, but wasn't able to eat it due to her severe dehydration. Banaszewski shoved the toast into her mouth and struck her face several times with a curtain rod. She violently threw Likens into the basement, and with the assistance of Hubbard, she tied and bludgeoned her until she was unconscious. Likens managed to recover, but was unable to speak intelligibly and move her limbs properly. Jesus Christ. I guess it's worse. Likens tried to exit the basement, but collapsed, and before she could make it to the stairs. Banaszewski crushed her head with her feet and stood there for several moments. On October 26th, after multiple beatings, burnings, and scalding baths, Likens died of a brain hemorrhage, shock, and malnutrition. She was 16 years old. When Stephanie Banaszewski and Richard Hobbs realized that Likens was not breathing, Stephanie tried to give her mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Banaszewski, however, shouted at them that Likens was faking it. When Banaszewski finally realized that Likens was dead, she sent Hobbs to call the police from a nearby payphone. When the police arrived, Gertrude Banaszewski handed them the letter she forced Likens to write a few days previously. But before the police officers left the house, however, Jenny Likens approached them and said, Get me out of here and I'll tell you everything. Just like she did in the movie. Mm -hmm. Her statement, combined with the discovery of Likens' body, prompted the officers to arrest Gertrude, Paula, Stephanie, and John Banaszewski, Richard Hobbs, and Coy Hubbard for murder. Other neighborhood children present at the time, Mike Monroe, Randy Lepper, Darlene McGuire, Judy Duke, and Anna Sisko were arrested for injury to person. Like you said in the movie, um, the girl next door was a little bit um, overtly sexual and vulgar, which I feel kind of wasn't warranted because I don't think that was the case Yeah. in the real life story. In the autopsy of Sylvia's body, they had discovered that um, due to all the abuse, her vagina was essentially swollen shut, but the hymen was still intact, proving that she was a virgin. So, um, as you said, there was a scene where uh, some boys were raping her, I assume you mean having sex with her. Yeah. Um, so that couldn't have been the case in the real story. Okay. And just some of the things, but there were some details from the girl next door that weren't included in an American crime, like the story about the toast and her not being able to eat it. Right. Um. And you said in that movie she was gagged, but it was never shown in American Crime that she had been gagged. But uh, in real life, there were stories about her being gagged and then beaten. So I would say The Girl Next Door is definitely more inspired by the story. And American Crime was, I would say, really close to the original story. I mean, it was based off the court transcripts. So there were some direct quotes that were... Yeah. I just feel like it had been watered down to a more palatable yeah. level. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, we did see the, like coke bottle scene once um but it sounds like that happened on multiple occasions and there were other other times like you said she was like forced to like masturbate at one point and Mm -hmm. you know so there were like some sexual things however not quite to the level she was never like yeah raped or touched or like just left there naked and stuff like that but the level of torture and beatings uh wasn't even touched upon in american crime yeah However, the storyline was definitely a lot more accurate. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead to, like, getting into the real versus movies. No, it's fine, but it's fine. I do have more information about um, the trial and things afterward, unless there was anything else you wanted to add. No, go for it, please. Cool. So Gertrude Banaszewski, her children, Richard Hobbs, and Coy Hubbard, who, if I didn't mention before, Coy Hubbard was Stephanie Banaszewski's boyfriend. Yeah, you mentioned it. And he okay. was actually in American Crime also. Mm-hmm. I didn't mention it, though, so. That's right. Um, They were all held without bail pending their trials. Gertrude denied responsibility for Sylvia's death, pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. So the four minors also put on trial were uh, Paula, who was 17, John, who was 13, Richard Hobbs, who was 15, and Coy Hubbard, who was 15. As for the convictions, um, the injury to person charges against the neighborhood children, who were Anna Ruth Sisko, Judy, Darlene Duke, Michael, John, Mike Monroe, uh, Darlene McGuire, and Randy Gordon and Leeper, were dropped. 
Uh, none of the younger Banishevsky children, so Marie, Shirley, other John or James, and Dennis Lee Wright, uh, were not convicted. Stephanie Banishevsky was never charged with the murder of Sylvia Likens. It is believed that any charges against her were dropped for turning evidence over to the state. Stephanie eventually changed her name and became a school teacher. She is married and has several children. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Banaszewski Jr. were all convicted of manslaughter and given two 2-21 two to 21 year prison sentences, which I don't know what a 2-21 to 21 year prison sentence is, but Richard Hobbs, he served two years for his part in the murder of Sylvia Likens. He wow. died, yeah, just two years. He died of cancer in 1972 at the age of 21, like you said. Coy Hubbard also served two years for his part in the murder of Sylvia Likens. He never changed his name and stayed in the Indianapolis area for most of his life. Um, he was tried for another murder in 1982, but was acquitted. And he reportedly lost his job in 2007 when the movie An American Crime was released. He died of a heart attack in June of 2007. Wow. John was the youngest inmate at Indian State Reformatory and served two years. So like you said, the youngest inmate. He was allegedly the only member of the Banaszewski family to publicly show remorse and uh, made no attempt to hide his past, although he did change his name to John Blake and became a lay minister and real estate agent with his wife. He had three children, and he died of cancer in 2005 at the age of 52. Jeez. Paula Banaszewski was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Gertrude Banaszewski was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. In 1971, Gertrude and Paula Banaszewski were granted another trial because of a, quote, prejudicial atmosphere due to heavy news media publicity before and during the trial. Gotcha. Basically saying they felt like they got an unfair trial because of the already, like, negative stigma following them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Paula pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter, so she um, got a lesser sentence. She was paroled in March of 1972, but not before trying to escape prison twice unsuccessfully both times wait this was the year after her second trial yes okay um but she was released uh completely in march of 1974 meaning that she served about seven years for the death of sylvia likens that's just sickening mm -hmm. gertrude was again convicted of first degree murder at her retrial and sentenced to life in prison over the next 14 years in prison gertrude was a model prisoner and served as a mother figure to the other inmates, earning the nickname Mom. <laughs> That's disgusting. So fucked up. It's even more disgusting. In 1985, the parole board released Gertrude from prison based on good behavior. Um, did she, they not have the death penalty in Indiana? Uh, no, I think they did. She was just given life. I don't know why, but she, yeah, she was given life in prison over the death penalty. Jesus Christ. Okay. The parole board to release her was a three to two vote. So just barely made it. Um, so Gertrude Banaszewski served uh, about 20 years for the murder of Sylvia Likens. That's... Gertrude moved to Iowa where she assumed the name Nadine Van Fossen, which was her middle name and her maiden name. She died on June 16th, 1990 at the age of 60. She died of lung cancer. After Paula was released from prison, she moved to Iowa and changed her name to Paula Pace. She married and had two children and managed to hide her past until 2012. When she was discovered for who she really was, she was fired from her job as an aide to a school counselor for lying on her job application. Hmm. And like in the movie, she did give birth to a baby girl who she named Gertrude. And uh, that child uh, ended up being adopted. And I believe uh, her name was changed as well, the child. I hope to God so. Uh, Jenny Likens, who, I don't know if this is ironic or just cruel, or I don't know. After the trial, Jenny Likens ended up living with the family of the, um, prosecutor, I believe, the prosecuting attorney. Okay. But, uh, I'm assuming because her parents were still on the road for carnival working, so, um... Yeah, she went to go live with another family again, but uh, I think she stayed with them until she was old enough to be out on her own. So, um, I think she was much happier with that family, which I hope was the case. But um, Jenny Likens died from a heart attack in 2004 at the age of 54. It's amazing how many people died right before this movie came out. Yeah, it's just kind of crazy how many people, yeah, seem to die relatively young and a lot from cancer. So yeah. I don't know if it's karma. Not saying that Jenny Likens deserved any karma. Right. But right, right, a right. lot of the people who were involved. Hmm. Anyway. Yeah. So as we said, um, an American crime was pretty close to the true story. I mean, it was based off of the court transcripts. So it's as true as the court transcripts are. And then um, the girl next door was definitely more inspired by or loosely based. 
Right. And the girl next door definitely tried to capitalize on... Uh, you mean like shock value? Yeah, shock value. Which kind of makes me feel yucky about that. Right. So, yeah. And it was definitely a heavy story this week. And you had another story you wanted to share with us, yeah. right? About something from this week? Yeah. So, you know, this is a really like, disturbing and depressing story. So I wanted to end on a happier note and tell a story that um, is going to have a better ending, hopefully. Um, so this is actually a recent case, and it's a more local case to us. So the story begins on October 15th of last year when 13-year-old Jamie Kloss went missing from her home in Barron, a small town in western Wisconsin that is it's kind of north uh, northwest of uh, Minneapolis. Jamie's parents were found dead in their home with the front door open and Jamie missing. Posters and flyers went up all over town and throughout the surrounding areas. And we were actually in Wisconsin at this time because we were looking um, at apartments for our move up here. And I remember when we received the Amber Alert on our phones about her missing yeah um after being gone for almost 90 days uh jamie kloss was found last thursday january 10th in the small town of gordon in northern wisconsin Jeannie nutter a retired child protective services worker was out walking her dog henry nutter said i'm glad my dog wanted to go for a walk and we did and there she was kloss had approached nutter looking thin with matted hair and wearing shoes that were too big for her she told nutter who she was and that she was lost and nutter took her to the nearest house Nutter told the woman who answered the door that this was Jamie Kloss and that she should call 911. She also told the family that they should arm themselves because they didn't know if Kloss's captor was pursuing them. Um, I read an article. They were like, they told her two things. They told her to call 911 and to grab a gun. (laughs) Smartly so. (laughs) The police arrived shortly thereafter and took Jamie to safety. She was able to provide them with a description of her kidnapper's car. Her kidnapper is 21-year-old Jake Thomas Patterson. Police were able to quickly apprehend him in his vehicle, and they believe he was out driving around looking for the missing teen. Hmm. Not a lot of information is known right now about the motive behind why Patterson abducted Jamie and killed her parents, and there is no apparent connection between the two or her family. It is believed that Patterson acted alone. The Barron County District Attorney's Office is expecting to charge Patterson with two counts of homicide and one count of kidnapping. Jamie has been medically cleared and reunited with her family and dog Molly. As news of Jamie's recovery spread, businesses in Barron that once posted signs of her missing are now making banners and billboards that said, Welcome home, Jamie. Since this case is still so new and the story is still developing, uh, not a lot of details are known about what happened to Jamie yet. All I can say is that this is one incredibly strong young lady. I wanted to contrast the story with that of Sylvia Likens, who struggled to escape and couldn't even get the help of her next-door neighbors or supposed friends or schoolmates. And in Jamie's story, total strangers in a town that she was unfamiliar with came to her aid and were able to bring her home. This story could have had a much sadder ending, but Jamie wrote her own ending. As the Barron County Sheriff who worked on this case said, Jamie is the hero in this case. So this week, Jamie Kloss, we drink to you. Sounds good. Thank you for sharing, babe. Yeah, that's definitely an ending to that story that we're happy to hear. You know, she was found, what, 70 miles away from where she was kidnapped. Yeah, I think something like that. And, you know, with, she was gone, what, 88 days, I think is mm-hmm. what they said. You know, when I guess whenever somebody's been missing that long, you never, you don't know what's going to happen, you know, like what's, what they're going to find, mm-hmm. what the condition is going to be. So, I don't know, it, it's definitely a happy ending. And yeah. You literally told me about um, that they found her this morning, and I was like, oh, perfect. Like, <laughs> yeah. hearing that and being able to contrast it with the story of Sylvia Likens, I thought it would, would be a good way to end this story. So leave yeah. it on a happier note. Absolutely. And I'm just glad to be done with the story of Sylvia Likens because it's... It's heavy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, next week we have uh, Helter Skelter for mm-hmm. you. Yeah, uh-huh. so we finally <laughs> finished the movie. Yeah, so uh, we'll be talking about that next week. Coming at you again. Some new drinks, some new details, some new movies and facts. Mm-hmm. We hope y'all have a good week. Go do something fun now. Yeah. Take your mind <laughs> off of heavy stuff. <laughs> and uh, like always, you can find us on Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, iTunes, Spotify. Um, you can find us on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at drink to fact and you can email us at drink to fact at gmail.com yep anything else you got babe no just we love to hear from you guys yeah like always rate review and subscribe thanks guys thanks cheers